everybody. Welcome to another episode of Straight Art BS Podcast. I want to thank uh, everybody for continuing to share the videos, liking them. It uh, really helps the algorithm. I want to uh, point out specifically Janine Miller and uh, William Rodriguez, I'm pretty sure. Uh, thank you so much for being my uh, Patreon members. Uh, if anybody else is interested in that kind of stuff, details are in the description, but I don't really want to rag on about that too much. Uh, just know that it's there if you're interested. Um, and yeah, so thank you everybody for their support and whatnot. And uh, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to cover? Uh, I want to do a moment of silence for the person still struggling with uh, addiction, uh, intrusive thoughts, anything like that. So on the count of three, I'm going to do a moment of silence. One, two, three. <clears throat> okay, thank you for that. And... I think that's about it. Just like keep kicking ass with sharing and whatnot because we, we have a, a ton of views and it's crazy. I never thought we were going to get this much uh, exposure, exposure, so it's cool. So let's keep it up. So without further ado, uh, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself and like what school you went to and what year. Thank you so much for having me. I am Caroline Cole and I went to the Academy at Ivy Ridge from 2004 to 2006 and so total i was there for 29 months okay and uh can you give us like a little backstory like before the program like what led up to you going there did you get transported that whole thing yeah so i my mom and i had been having some relationship issues for several years and there were just dynamics in my family that weren't the healthiest and my mom will tell you now that, you know, really she had a lot of unhealed trauma and was just trying to do the best that she could being a parent. And, you know, as a parent myself now, like we make a lot of mistakes and you kind of, you know, try and, and do better. Um, but at that time, I was like super invested into like music culture. I lived in San Diego at the time. My favorite movie was Almost Famous. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it's, you know, I wanted to be a music journalist more than anything. And so I was listening to like punk rock. I was begging my mom to let me have like a mohawk. Um, <laughs> and just like my mom saw like my fishnets and like my band tees and all of that. And she was like, okay, I think she's like headed down the wrong path. Like she was really concerned. And also at that time, I really... And can I cuss? Is that okay if I cuss? Yeah, it's totally fine. Okay, okay. So, like, I really started to develop kind of this, like, fuck you attitude. You know, like, I'm going to wear what I want to wear. I'm going to be who I want to be. And, you know, you can't tell me any different. And so we just butt heads um, about a lot of things. And and so I think that that was really kind of the foundation of a lot of our issues. And then it branched out kind of into other things. And so there was a point in time where my mom was um, dating this guy and they wanted to move to um, South America, to Colombia. And I was going to be starting high school the very next year. And I had like a good core group of friends. Like I was so excited to start high school. I'm like, there's no way I'm moving to South America with you and your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Like absolutely the hell not. That's not happening. Um, and so I started to really dig in my heels. Um, and there were like several big fights you know, kind of through this time frame, And I think my mom just like, didn't know what to do, but she knew that like, we were really starting to head in opposite directions. Um, and so, you know, she got online, she got on Google, she started searching help for my daughter. And um, she found the teen help website, WASP website. And you know, what she thought at the time is that it was just like an independent referral kind of hub for parents to to learn about what kinds of resources there are out there. She didn't really realize that this was like the marketing arm of WASP and that anyone who calls, like you're going to be referred to a TTI program. She she didn't even, you know, she didn't even have that language to um, be able to like describe that right at the time. Like she just didn't know. And of course she got on the phone with these people and they were like, oh my goodness, we help so many families that are just like yours. And there's so many wonderful success stories. They sent her to this website that had, you know, all of these different quotes from families who apparently just, you know, had, had great success with the programs. And so I believe within about a week of her, um, 
you know, contacting Teen Help, I was transported to Ivy Ridge. And so my transport was a little bit different, I think, than a lot of people's because mine was actually not in the middle of the night. It was in the middle of the day. Hmm. And I know, I think I like, I feel like I'm the only person that I've talked to um, that has been transported in the day. I don't know if that was like something that my mom decided. I have no idea. Um, But I, I had actually thought I was going to a summer camp. So like I'm in my room. I'm packing my bag. I had like my canteen, my laundry bag for camp. Like I'm thinking I'm going to go, you know, chill out at this camp for a few weeks. And so right at that time, I was like um, putting my little address book together so I could write my friends. And I was putting like little uh, like glamour shots of my friends and I. I don't know if anyone remembers like glamour shots from that era. But, you know, you go to the mall, get your picture taken with your friends. And uh, so like right at that time, um, I had had my bedroom door locked and this guy just like kicked in my door and it was him and this lady standing there and they came in and they're like shouting, they're like, don't make any sudden movements. You're under our custody now, you know, and, and just like, it was like, you know, extremely startling. I had never been through anything like that. And, you know, all around, I was kind of like a rule follower to an extent. Um, like I wasn't, I wasn't planning on fighting them, you know? And so they were like, you know, if you have anything on you, kick it under the bed. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I just truly didn't, I was like, what do you mean? What do, what would I have on me? And they're like drugs. If you have any drugs on you, like kick it under the bed and we'll act like we didn't see it. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't have anything on me. And, uh, Anyways, yeah, they transported me to Ivy Ridge. It took a couple of days. We ended up staying in a hotel uh, together. And then um, they actually connected with two different transporters once we were in New York City. Uh, And then they drove all the way. I think it was about an eight-hour drive into, like, upstate New York. Yeah. Did they hit (laughs) you? Um, so they didn't at the time, um, but they had pretty much said like the handcuffs were there and they were like, we will do it if we have to. Um, but essentially I had just told them, I'm like, look, I'm not, I'm not planning on like running. I, in fact, at the time, and this is what's so ironic about it is that like, I didn't, I didn't know where I was going. I, I had no idea. I actually, you know, they told me that they were taking me to a boarding school And at first I was kind of like low key excited. I'm like, okay, maybe this is going to be cool. Like maybe this is going to be like college, you know, maybe I'm going to be able to have some freedom from my family and we'll get this like opportunity to kind of develop on my own. Um, And so I really had no idea what to expect. I mean, looking back now, if I would have known what it was going to be like, I think I would have responded very differently. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you thought you were going to get actually sent to a regular an actual boarding school, not a boarding school. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, I, in, what's so kind of sad, I was so naive at the time, but even up until the point that we rolled up to the campus and I was walking through the front doors, like I still thought maybe this is going to be cool. <laughs> I still was like, yeah, there was a staff member there. Uh, she was one of the supervisors and we showed up in the middle of the night. So she met us right there at the front door. And I remember like smiling and being like, hi, I'm Caroline. Like I stuck out my hand. I was like, <laughs> she didn't want it. She she was not like enthused at all with my like niceties. Like she could have given a shit. She was just like, okay, come on, come on in. And um, like uh, very quickly I started realizing, okay, shit, this is not, <laughs> this is not going to be fun. I'm not going to have like band posters up on the wall in my room and like, you know, hang out and have slumber parties with my friends in our dorm rooms, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so you got there in the middle of the night. Do you remember, how much do you remember about, like, your first, like, few days there? Do you remember? I do actually remember my first few days pretty vividly. Um, Especially the, so since I arrived there in the middle of the night, they had taken me over to the dorms. And, of course, everyone was already asleep. It was, like, 3 a.m. And they brought me into a bathroom and they strip searched me. And that was like really the first time that I had been 
unclothed in front of like anyone except for you know my mom um and especially at that age like even then that would have been weird in front of my mom uh and so you know they were like squat and cough um do jumping jacks you know they had me do a bunch of stuff to show that like i wasn't bringing in contraband and then after that they put me on a mattress in um the hallway and i I remember they told me, you know, like, keep your hands above the blankets. Like, you can't put your hands underneath the blankets because we need to, you know, see what you're doing at all times. And they had already taken my shoes and my shoelaces and all of that. And uh, I remember the next morning, I think this is really when it hit me. This is really when it hit me that, like, this is very weird what's going on here. Um, I, all of a sudden, you know, the staff member comes out into the hallway and they start shouting, everybody wake up, line up, it's time to get up, let's go, come on, five, four, they're counting down. And and all these girls start rushing out of the, um, you know, dorm rooms and into the hallway and they're lining up and counting off. And I'm like, I didn't know where I needed to be. So I um, started asking some of the girls, I was like, I'm sorry, I'm new here. Like, where should I be? I don't know where to go. And I remember they were like looking at me like, uh, <laughs> like, why is she talking to me? And of course, again, I had no idea about like the program structure. So I'm just like talking to anybody, you know? And uh, finally one of the dorm parents came over to me and she was like, oh, right. You're the new girl who showed up in the middle of the night. Um, yeah, so you're not allowed to talk to anybody. Um, you're not allowed to look at anybody. You need to keep your head down you know, go in there into the bathroom, get changed up for the day, and then come back out here and line up. And so they, you know, ended up placing me with a hope buddy, what they called like a hope buddy, the person who was supposed to, you know, show me kind of the ins and outs of the program. And I just remember it just was so impossible to do anything right. For like the first several months, it felt that way. You know, it was like, oh, you're slouching. Oh, you're leaning on the wall oh, you can't say thank you. That's a correction. Oh, you forgot your water bottle here. That's another correction. Oh, you looked out of line. There's, a, I mean, it just like was freaking impossible. And I, I truly tried, you know, because I had this mentality that I thought if I did good, I would get to go home. Like if I follow the rules and I show that I can do this, then maybe my mom will come get me. Um, and yeah, after being there for two and a half years, it obviously didn't quite work out that way <laughs> for sure <clears throat> okay did they go did they go over rules with you like formally and they're like or that like, did they hand you a rule manual do you remember them doing any of that sort of stuff yeah they did hand me a rule book and um also like a rules sheet that kind of listed all of the corrections on it so cat category one corrections category two and I mean, they told me the rules, you know, over and over again, but it's so much to keep up with. Um, and it just, I feel like goes against everything that you would naturally do. You know, yeah. you're used to like being in the world where you can look at people and talk to people and, and move around freely. Um, you know, you can put salt and pepper on your food or you can not eat all the food if you didn't want. That was one of the rules that our program is we had to eat everything. Um, and so, it was definitely a challenge adjusting, um, but like, again, just kind of highlighting my naivety at the time, I truly thought like, I'm gonna be out of here like so quick. I'm gonna be out of here so quick. This sucks. My mom's just doing this to scare me. And then she's gonna come get me and be like, okay, I hope you learned your lesson or something. Like there was no reality in which I actually thought I was gonna be there until I graduated. Were, were you on any medications before you went there? I was on a relatively small dose of Lexapro. And I, like, kind of don't even remember what, like, if it did all that much for me, I don't think it did. Um, but I know at the time, once I was there at the program, I started seeing a psychiatrist and they had diagnosed me with oppositional defiance disorder. And my mom, and this is not ragging on my mom here, um, because we've like come a far way, but like she still brings it up sometimes and it just drives me nuts. I'm like, I don't, and I never did have oppositional defiance disorder. Like, please stop bringing this up as if that was ever actually true. Um, what I did have was ADHD 
And it took me like 30 years to get some answers with that. But looking back now, it's like, that's actually what was like happening that whole time. Um, but yeah, so I, a little bit of Lexapro, but they didn't, they didn't really give any other medications there. In fact, I think most people, I don't want to speak for everyone who went to Ivy Ridge, but I think most people actually experienced a complete lack of any kind of medication at Ivy Ridge. Yeah, it, I found uh, throughout doing my interviews and whatnot, it's either they load you up with medications, they cut you off cold turkey, or they kind of just only let you have certain medications. Like, it'll be one of those three things, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. So you were there two and a half years, you said? Yeah, two and a half years. I completed the program. I graduated, went through all the seminars, staffed seminars. At one point was on student council. I think I held the record for the most amount of times that an upper level had been on probation. <laughs> and probation. by the time- Meaning like category three probation? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I dropped a lot. Like I, it was almost comical. Like I would be, I think I was actually on probation on upper levels more than I actually was an upper level. Um, and finally what did it, and this is what's, I, I didn't know this at the time. And I just found this out actually within the last couple of years. Um, but my mom was thinking about pulling me and that's when all of a sudden my program started like flying by. Like I can look back now in it. Cause I remember all of a sudden feeling like, oh my God, I'm not dropping anymore. I'm starting to go get, like get through pretty quickly. Like it just felt like they, like there was a shift and I look back now knowing that that's exactly when that happened. My mom was going to pull me. They were like, oh, no, no, no. You've got to like finish the program. You've got to like, you know, you don't want her to end up uh, right back where she was and undo all the progress that she's made and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I think what they were wanting, of course, is like the more people they graduate, the better it looks on them, right? Like they want to show that kids are graduating and having this like success. So then all of a sudden they started pushing me through the program. Um, and within a few months, I was graduating. <clears throat> okay, I was at my program for 22 months. I was the last person to graduate before it shut down. And uh, I didn't get to this level six, but I went through all the seminars, I staffed seminars. So this will be pretty interesting. Um, okay, how long after you got there did you go through your first seminar? I want to say... And I'm not sure if this is completely accurate because, you know, when you're going through things like that, sometimes time can feel kind of weird. Um, but I want to say it was about three months. And then I went through orientation as the first seminar. And I hear that some people kind of depending on what time frame you were in WASP, like some people didn't have that orientation seminar and they just went straight to discovery. But I did orientation first, then discovery. And I think I like chose out of discovery at least twice one for like not cracking my bathroom door open enough and then another one i think for something stupid but yeah okay so i went through orientation too i went through orientation discovery focus key or principles principles is the one that i fucking shows out of actually i think like two or three times because did you do principles too yeah yeah. That's when we have to get everything right to like a T. You can't get anything wrong. You have to follow the instructions like to a T. And it's literally you have to do it perfect. It's the only way to do it. And fucking, but yeah, I, I chose out of that one two or three times. But when I, because I rebelled for my first year there, and you can hear more about my story. I have a whole bunch of it on my channel and whatnot. I don't want to waste too much time on it. But I spent the first year of my program rebelling. And so by the time I started working my program, I was just, just like, you know what, fuck it. I need to do whatever I need to do to get out of here. Because, like, they threatened me with Jamaica. They were like, we're just going to send you there and just tell your parents afterwards. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Like, people told me, you know, they don't even have child protection laws out there. So. so they said the same thing to us, which is crazy that it was like that across programs. They, they, I mean, they constantly threatened us with Jamaica. And they would say that exact line. Like, there's no child protection laws there to help you. And then what's especially awful is that they even kind of framed the death of one of the girls at 
Tranquility Bay as like, you know, an extra threat of why we, you know, wouldn't want to go. Like, oh, there was even a girl that died there and she was trying to run away and she died. That's what they told us at the time, which now we know is not true. Um, but it's just disgusting. It's just disgusting that they would use that. I, I don't know. It's just awful. These places are awful. Do you remember how many people, like rough estimate, were there when you got there and how many people were there when you left? <laughs> Yeah, so when I got there, um, the, I mean, over, I think across the girls' side and the boys' side, I want to say maybe there was like 150. There was not, I mean, it, not very many, considering later when Casa by the Sea would be shut down, all the Casa kids came to Ivy Ridge. And that happened um, in the middle of when I was there. And so then it ballooned up to, I want to say we had about like 500 kids there there was quite a bit um and so in each like family if you will we had um a, a, like upwards of 30 30 kids in each family um so yeah it, it got quite large but then at ivy ridge um there were a couple of things that really reduced the number of kids that we had there the first one was there was a riot and many kids ran away a lot of them got arrested, unfortunately. And so I think uh, the New York Times actually did a story about it. And some of the parents saw that and they were like, oh, what's going on at this place that these kids are like rioting? Like, let's look into this. And they pulled their kids. Um, my mom did not. I stayed. And then the second thing that happened was um, there was a massive lawsuit and investigation from New York State because they found out that Ivy Ridge was issuing false diplomas and that they were actually not accredited at all to be giving out any kind of diploma or, or you know, doing any kind of schoolwork, period. So a lot of parents pulled their kids at that time too, but I also stayed. <laughs> okay, were you there for that riot? Yeah, yeah okay, I was. What, what do you remember about like the, the day of the riot? Like, what do you remember about that? So it, it, this is actually kind of interesting. I feel like I might have a unique perspective on the riot. Um, so, of course, no one knew that this was going to happen, at least on the girls' side. We didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, and this was something that I believe about a group of 40 boys had been planning for many weeks. And so it happened at, pretty late at night. I want to say it was about 1030. And over in the dorms, we had um, motion sensors on all of the windows. So the windows had bars and then they had motion sensors on the outside. And so, I mean, it would get tripped off for anything. Like if there was a big enough snowflake that passed by that motion sensor, it would set it off. If there was a leaf, like it would set it off. So this thing was like really dialed in. Um, and so frequently we were kind of used to like the alarm going off in the middle of the night, all of us having to line up they would check and make sure we were all there. And then they would say, you know, you're all clear, go back to bed. But this time was different. Um, I was laying awake in bed and I'm sorry, actually, let me go back and explain one detail that I feel like is important. So the dorms, how they were set up is imagine just like a long rectangular building. One half of that building was the girl's side. And then the other half was the boy's side. Well, the boys had a section of rooms that were open. And so the facility administration decided to place one girl's family over on the boy's side, but it would be separated by a door. So like we couldn't see each other. We weren't in the same hallways, but we were on the same side of the building. And so I just happened to be on probation, of course, um, on probation in that family who was placed on that side of the dorms. So yeah, I mean, we heard a massive crash downstairs. Um, it sounded like glass breaking, furniture moving, people shouting, yelling, screaming. You heard voices coming over the radio saying, backup staff, backup staff. And like, you could just hear that it was absolute chaos. And I remember standing there just like, oh my God, I hope people are okay. You know, because it's, it, it, it's so terrifying seeing your friends and people that you care about being restrained you know, and you could just hear it all going on. You knew what was happening down there. Um, it was not good. And so, like I said, you could kind of hear this like glass breaking and it sounded like, you know, someone kicking out the uh, um, 
metal mesh that was over the windows. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you could hear, we've got a runner, we've got a runner. And, and several people, you know, ran. It felt like it lasted two hours. It realistically, the biggest point of the riot in and of itself probably lasted maybe 15, 20 minutes. But I know that um, boys who were on that side and, um, you know, witnessed a lot of it, they said that it went on for a lot longer than that. Um, but, you know, these kids have been planning it for a while. They had gotten um, pool, pool balls and put um, pool balls in tube socks so they could, like, you know, swing it like that. And it was kind of like, quite frankly, it was kind of an orchestrated thing. And I was impressed that a lot of people were able to actually get out. But of course, what ended up happening is they were picked up by local police and and incarcerated, you know, because of it. So, um, but yeah, the the riot was. That they went to jail. Yeah, some oh, of them okay. did. Yep, okay. some of them did. Um, some of them were returned to the facility. I know most people who were like involved, and I say that loosely because this is really like what the school was saying, is that um, most people who were involved uh, were expelled. So, you know, that's what happened. Um, okay. it, it sucks and it's sad. Yeah, I think there were probably a lot of lives that were affected because of that, unfortunately. You know, now they have a record. Now they're dealing with charges. Now, you know, I don't know. It's just bad news. Okay. <clears throat> um, did you ever, did they have like any study hall or intervention, like solitary confinement there? Yeah, so we had an intervention room, and of course, it, they used to call it OP, Observational Placement. And um, they also had study hall. I was in study hall quite a bit. And, you know, they would have you sit in study hall structure and sit there and write. At one point, it, they had us write the rule book over and over again. And then finally, they changed it up, and then we could actually copy textbooks, which was, believe it or not, more exciting than writing the rule book. <laughs> And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you would just sit in study hall and work off study hall points. Um, they would have you do study hall fitness, which was especially brutal, con you know, considering what staff member was staffing study hall that day. And like I said, I was on probation so freaking much that, like, I feel like I just sat in study hall most of my program. Um, yeah, it was not a great place to be. Did they let you have, uh, when you got, was there like an upper levels? Like when you got to like level four, did you go to like a different part of the facility? Was there any of that? So they did have an upper levels um, program. And that was once you reach level four and up, you were technically considered an upper level. And, uh, you know, as we all know, like there were a lot of perks to be in an upper level. As a girl, you could wear your hair down. You could wear makeup. You could talk. Um, you could walk around freely. You didn't have to walk in line anymore. And they, um, we also had special rooms where we could, you know, dorm with other girls and you could talk to each other. You could shut your door at night. Um, of course, you had like all of your privileges in your room with you. And then we even had like an upper level lounge, which I know at the time, like was like the coolest thing in the world. There was a TV in there and we could watch movies. We could listen to music. And those were the things that, like, I really missed, music especially. So being able to have that was, like, you know, made made us feel semi-human again, I think. <clears throat> How long did it take you to get to level four the first time? Oh, my gosh. Um, over a year. I want to say it took me about 16 months to get level four. Um, I got stuck on level three for a while. I was on level two for forever. I mean, it just took me overall a really long time to move up. Um, what we found out later, and I think that this really plays a large part in why it took me so long, um, our family representatives there, and so like if you're not familiar with that term, a family rep is the person who was responsible for communicating with your parents, and they were essentially like your caseworker once you were there. So I found out later on that our family reps at Ivy Ridge actually got a commission. And so oftentimes, like, I look back and I wonder, like, how much of the things that I got in trouble for were actually fabricated or just done intentionally. 
Um, and of course, you know, this has been a conversation when when the names of some of these corrections sound so dramatic, like major rude act, disrespect to staff, major disrespect. You know, it's like, I'm sure my mom is getting these reports thinking like, what the hell is she doing there? You know, and I think a lot of parents do, right? Like they're getting, I mean, I would as a parent, if they were like, your son, uh, you know, got a major disrespect to staff, I'd be like, what did he do? Like kick this guy in the balls or something? Like it, it sounds that extreme, right? Um, and so, so yeah, our family reps were getting commission and I, I can't help but think about how many different probations I had that were absolutely probably fabricated. I got a trend of consequences. Like, you know, some of this has to be intentional. It just has to be. Did, did you guys, were you guys able to have a lockbox and have food sent up? No. You did if you were not, you see, see. At Spring Creek, you could have food set up, but it has to be it had to be kept in your lockbox, and you could ha you had that at lower facility when you got under the upper levels. But if you were on probation, so if you got any any cat threes that week, you couldn't eat your food. You couldn't eat the food. You, you oh, could have wow. it in your cabin, but you couldn't eat it. And if you did eat it, you would get a category four theft, stealing from yourself and breaking. I, I think it was either category four insubordination or category four theft. Okay, so so. Let me let me tell you kind of like what our probation was like, and I want you to tell me if this was what it was like at Spring Spring Creek. So when we got a cat three or even a trend of consequences, right? So like any three of the same correction that week, we were automatically put back on lower levels and you lost like all your privileges and you had to do at least a two week probation. And then you had to go back through the vote up process to get back to your level. So like, would you guys actually be like demoted, I guess, down to your family or like you just lost some privileges? <clears throat> so being on probation in the upper levels, that just means you couldn't, you would didn't have like privileges. Like you couldn't go into the lobby and play video games. You couldn't eat from your lockbox. But I, what you're talking about sounds more like a full on drop. Right, like, yeah. Which, which I did several times. Like I, the highest level I got, was level five, but I dropped several times from level four to like, I dropped into all the lower level families. Like I started yeah. with honor and I, and by the time I was gone, like it, I was, I had been in all of them. Everybody knew who I was. Like, it's just, it's crazy. Oh, that's so funny. I went through the same thing. They dropped me so many times that like, it just actually, it, it started to not bother me anymore. Like I used to be, just be devastated by it. Right. Like I'd be like crying, like, putting my hair back in a braid and I'm just like, you know, cause it's so disappointing. It's like, fuck, like I want to go home. I w want to go on my off grounds or like whatever it is. And it just was over nonsensical stuff. Like I remember one time I dropped because they, and a lot of people dropped during this time, unfortunately, but they um, had done room inspections and I guess they found a makeup brush in my makeup bag that didn't have my initials on it. And that was considered an illegal item. And so I dropped. That was a cat three consequence. I dropped. And um, I just at that point was like so numb to all of it that I was just like, fine, like, like, let's fucking do this again. Let's just go. Like, I'm so done with just like, you know, being upset about it every single time because like you couldn't turn, turn around or do anything there without getting, you know, punished for something so dumb. Uh, and like I said, I mean, I truly, like, I love the stories about survivors who go into facilities and they're just, like, new from the get-go that they were like, fuck this place, fuck these people. I wasn't that way. And I don't know if it's because of my age, you know, I went in there when I was 14, but, like, I truly wanted to do good. I wanted to follow the rules. I wanted to prove to my mom I was ready to come home, like, and to an extent, that place really fucked with my head. Um, I think because I didn't have any kind of a guard up at all. Um, it especially just, you know, I look back at some of my journal entries and it's like, who was this person? <laughs> like, actually, who was this person? Um, and I, when I was there, they started, um, well, they, they had a, a chapel and they would have church every Sunday. And when you were an upper level, you had the option of going to church. 
And so I did. I went to church every single Sunday. I got super serious about like, you know, my religion and my faith. And, and you know, I like things have very much changed with how I feel about that. But at the time, it like, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it just gave me hope or if I felt like I belonged to something at the time. But I definitely left Ivy Ridge just like absolutely fucked in the head. <laughs> I totally, I totally feel you. Did, okay, <clears throat> did you have six categories of rules at that place? <clears throat> I'm just wondering why you dropped for a category three. Now on a trend, I'm just like trying to, I'm seeing the differences. Because uh, at Spring Creek, you could drop for a trend of cat threes. Like if you got three cat threes and I think like a week or something like that. Or maybe it was a day, I can't remember exactly. But um, then you, that would be a cat four. So, so I actually, I take that back. I'm so sorry. I take that back. We only had five categories. Okay. So like, yeah, That's like a cat five would be like, um, and I forget what they called it, but it would be like a self harm, right? Yeah. Like in, but a cat four would be like insubordination or like runaway plans. Right. And a cat three would be like, let's say you picked your nose. That's a major root act. Um, and then a cat three was also a trend. So, okay. Yeah, you're right. We did have five. I, I was mis okay. Yeah. I don't know why I said six. I think I was thinking oh, no, okay. levels, honestly. Yeah. Levels. Yeah. 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 No. And at first that's why I was like, yeah, we did, but no, we only with, with the corrections themselves, it was just five. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I guess they ran things differently at, at different WASP programs. And then I also know it, it changed depending on, um, like when you were there. So yeah. when, when I first got to Ivy Ridge, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. The people who were in administration actually got kind of a sick pleasure out of just making things miserable for us. You know, they would come into a room and they would be like, everybody in this room, pick up a demerit. And then it would be like, you know, a guessing game of like, what did we do you know, for everyone to deserve this demerit or, you know, everybody now you're running a mile or like, you know, I don't know. They were just like, it, it, it just was always this element of surprise. And then you would watch these staff members just kind of sit back and like smirk. And they just had like the sickest little smirk on their face as they just watched everyone like fall apart. Um, and then the facility was actually investigated by the state of New York. And I think that this at first was separate from the false diplomas. Um, I know that there had been a child that was restrained pretty violently. And I don't know how that got out. If it was the parents who contacted the state, I don't really know. Um, but I do know that the state began investigating that. And so all of a sudden, it was like overnight things at the facility changed. They wanted to make us seem like we were actually a school. So they made us a basketball team. They made a, a cheer squad. They um, had us put on a, a performance of Romeo and Juliet. They, like, you know, all of a sudden they started having these extracurricular things that we didn't have before. They started being a little bit more relaxed with some of the rules. Um, I remember at one point there was like a rumor that they would start letting us talk to each other at night in our dorm rooms. And I remember how excited everybody was because we were like, oh, my God, we can talk to each other. Like, this is so exciting. And that never happened. That never ended up panning out. But um, so, yeah, I think they they saw this investigation coming down the pipeline and they were like, um, we better start seeming less like a prison um, and more like uh, actual school. Um, and, and so things really kind of shifted after that, not that they were substantially better, but like ever so slightly added a little bit more quality of life than it was before. Okay. What, what was your experience of focus and did, did you get it through it the first time? <clears throat> I think I did. If I remember correctly, I think I did get through focus the first time and, you know, <laughs> I mean, all the seminars are just such a head trip. Um, I, at the time, like I said, I really kind of drank the Kool-Aid at that point. And so I was just excited to, you know, get through the seminar. And it was like one more thing I had to check off the list to get home. I knew at that point, my mom had made it very clear that like, you are graduating. And my mom had even gone to focus and she was going to the parent seminars and she was 
friends with other program parents and active on, um, gosh, I forget what it was called, but they had like a parent message board where they could all, you know, talk to each other. And, um, and so she was very much invested in the program. And I, you know, at that point was like, I've just got to do what I need to do to graduate and go home. But yeah, um, focus, my stretch was, I was a butterfly. Okay. And yeah. And um, I don't know. I mean, getting into like how the seminars impacted me, I look back on a lot of it now and think about some of the truly atrocious like feedback that um, we gave each other through those processes and just how harmful it was. Um, and I, I, I'll tell you this one thing, and I don't actually know if I'm allowed to, but I'm just going to. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we're coming out with a new season of Trapped in Treatment, and we were actually able to speak with someone who created those seminars. And he was also a facilitator. And so I asked him at one point in this interview, I was like, I'm like, so you know, because throughout the course of the interview, he had very directly said, like, you know, we weren't there to provide treatment. We're not therapists. This is about addressing behavior. And so I asked him, I'm like, well, you know, a lot of these kids come from having a very complex trauma background. Like, was there ever anything built into your program where you would address children differently or have more individualized care or like at what point would you say this is too much we should stop um and his response was so interesting he was like uh he said and i don't want to give this away because the season's not out yet but i just it, it was it's so fascinating to me he was like well, we had therapists on staff there. And so if any child was like essentially triggered or couldn't go through with the process, they would, you know, immediately be connected with a therapist. And I thought I like I and, and I want I want to know it had, did you ever see that happen? I never ever did, what like they barely <laughs> had they barely had therapists on site. Like they started having therapy like as an added like your parents would have to pay extra and my parents ended up paying extra for a therapist who i don't even know if she was even like had like certifications or anything but fuck no that yeah. sounds like the biggest load of bullshit i've ever heard i never once where? a therapist on call on site are you sit where yeah where, like, never secret door like what what do you in so the other thing that he said too, um, which I thought was interesting is he was like, you know, we received notes on all the kids before they come into this seminar. And so we already know, right, which they did. We know, we know they did. And um, which makes it even that much more fucked up is that like, you actually knew that this is a population of kids that you should not be doing this to, um, not to mention their entire program and process of their seminars was completely experimental and just some bullshit that they actually made up. Um, so harmful, so harmful. I mean, it, it, it truly is experimenting on children in the worst way possible. Um, it, I, I don't know. I'm baffled sometimes that like that technically was legal. I don't understand how it could be. Um, and that's still, you know, something I'm trying to figure out. But I think it ties into MK Ultra and like mind control and shit because it is mind control. It's brainwashing. And I don't know, I, I think, well, like, if you look at the techniques of, like, I actually have somebody that I interviewed, and they were comparing the techniques that they use in, sem in seminars uh, to, like, the techniques that they use against, like, prisoners of war to, like, get them to, like, break and shit, um, or it was, it was something like that. It was either that, or she was, like, comparing it to uh, how we deal with, like, certain people. Uh, I, I don't want to quote directly because I can't remember exactly what it was, but she was comparing it to something else, and it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, when they did an investigation, I believe it was back in, like, the mid-70s, they found that a lot of these techniques were similar to the brainwashing camps in North Korea. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. so it is 
it, it and that's what it is right it makes you question yourself it makes you question your identity it makes you question your reality and then on top of that you're experiencing things like sleep deprivation food deprivation you're putting being put in these like emotionally exhaustive experiences for hours and hours and hours and hours i mean it would break anybody nonetheless a child like you have a child these are children in there um it just like it's criminal it's criminal no one should be allowed to do that um you know this is why we have people who go to, to school for years and years and years and years to be able to provide things like therapy and there's still awful therapists out there <laughs> you know just because you have the degree doesn't mean you have the capacity to be able to to do that but the people who made these seminars didn't even have that <laughs> they had no education in any of this it was all just some philosophy or idea of what might work to like reform these behaviors you know i don't know um but yeah i think i think there's definitely a brainwashing element and a mind control element that's there um you know and i think as survivors we all know this because we feel those impacts of those seminars to this day exactly oh yeah to the audience uh i will post in the description of this video when it comes out uh like what that video was that I was mentioning, so you guys can go look at it, the comparison. But, um, okay, let's see here. <clears throat> did you do PC2 and PC3 and PC1? I did. Okay. Did you go on any home passes? I went on, I believe I only went on one home pass. And my mom at the time was living in New York City. And so, I mean... I, I think I was only there for maybe four days. Um, I did get to have a couple of off grounds while I was there. Some of them turned out not so great because I will say some of the family dynamics that led to me being at the program were still alive and well. <laughs> and, you know, for me, I actually had a lot of hope that my family might come out better. And I thought maybe we would be able to fix some of the things that just weren't good uh and so when i got back after one off grounds that did not go good um i remember i wrote like a big letter back to them where i was like i'm setting a boundary about this and that and you know what you did on the off grounds was unacceptable and and i look back at some of that and i'm actually i have to say like I'm, i was proud of my little self for kind of stepping out there and recognizing that at the time and also not backing down and kind of continuing that cycle um that had existed before with my family um but you know i also think not to jump ahead but i think that was the hardest part about going home too is realizing that everything was actually still the same not um so your parents got divorced and then your mom was with another boyfriend, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, they, my, my parents were divorced when I was like a baby. So I hadn't ever really had a relationship with my dad until I was much older. Okay. Okay. So so you didn't know your dad growing up? And so he wasn't part of like you getting sent off? Yeah, that was all your mom? Yeah. Okay. Um, what did you think about PC1? <clears throat> was that the first time that you saw your parents? Yeah, PC1 was the first time that I had seen my mom. And I want to say I had been at the program for about a year. And I, you know, I, quite frankly, I freaking missed my mom. I wanted to be home so bad. Like, sometimes how I describe it to people who have never been to the program is it's like the first night that you're at, a, like, overnight camp. And you're, like, in this strange bed around these strange people. And it's like you want nothing more than to just be like at home. And it's like that, but every single day for two and a half years, yeah, you know, yeah. like, yeah, it was terrible. And so, you know, seeing my mom was great, but I think they also at PC1 really encourage parents to like, you know, uh, put your foot down, encourage graduation, say how much, you know, like th that you're not going to waver and that your child has to graduate. And so that was really kind of the basis of PC1 for us is just reiterating that, Caroline, you are graduating the program. I'm not pulling you from this program. So while it was good to see her, it was really short lived. And, you know, I, I think, too, at the time, if I remember, 
right? Um, I had tried to talk about some of the family dynamics and I know I'm being a little bit vague there, but I also feel like my mom and I have worked on a lot since. And so I don't want to constantly make her also relive oh, that. Um, but, you know, and I just remember our conversations like getting nowhere. It was like, well, Caroline, you were making bad decisions and you were running around and doing this and that. And you were hanging out with the wrong people. And this is why you're here. And you earned yourself a seat here. You know, so it was just like all the same things that I had been hearing from the program. Okay. Um, let's see. What do you think the hardest part about being there was and how did you deal with it? I mean, I think the hardest part, I, I don't want to, like, I think the hardest part was being fucking trapped in uh, and not being able to leave or talk to anyone or move or, I mean, just being completely deprived of any kind of normal life or experiences. And I look back and I know so many survivors feel this way too. I feel like I will be eternally 14 for the rest of my life. I'm 33 years old now. I feel like a 14 year old. And it's so hard to break out of that. And I think for so many of us, it, it, it truly causes us to be somewhat emotionally and mentally stunted at that age of when we went in. Um, and so, and, and I think a lot of that is not only just because the experience in and of itself is traumatic and you're in that fight or flight for however long you're there, but it is just being actually deprived of an education of opportunity, of the normal, typical developmental milestones that kids go through at that age. And so, yeah, I mean, I I, I just think, <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a non-answer, but it, it, it is the program itself is the worst part. It's the day-to-day. -day. It's the knowing that you cannot get out. It's knowing that if you try to run, staff members at uh, the program I went to, they told us to break their legs. So if you knew that you wanted to run, your legs were going to be broken. And you knew that if you even got off of the campus, that the neighbors were going to shoot you or that, um, <clears throat> gosh, excuse me, I might have to grab a water. Hang on one second. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they told us that uh, there were turkey vultures out there. And that if we went into the woods, that we would be eaten. You know, they told us all different kinds of things. So, I mean, it's truly just every day that utter desperation that you feel of being completely trapped. There's nothing you can do. Okay, and how did you, um, how did you deal with it while you were there? Like, what were some ways you dealt with just the shittiness of being there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of similar to, you know, Paris's story, and I think a lot of us do this or did this in the program, but I literally just dreamed all day long. I mean, you had no option but to just be in your mind. And I would just dream about what I'm going to do when I get out, the kind of life I'm going to have. I mean, it was just a constant movie playing in my mind of I can't wait until I get out and I'm going to get back in school and I'm going to have friends and I'm going to go to concerts and I can't wait to go shopping or like just having a, a normal life. Um, and I think a lot of that too was just I dissociated the entire time I was there. I tried to be anywhere else but there. And I don't know if it really helped, um, but it, I got through it, I guess, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it didn't really make it all that much better, but that was really the only option that you had in that situation. Okay. Um, okay. If you could go back in a time machine and not go through the program, would you do it and why? Oh my God, I wish I could go back and have a different experience. 
I wish I could go back and just be a normal kid at that age. Um, it so significantly altered the course of my life that even, you know, a decade after I got out, my life was still impacted and, and is still impacted now, you know. And so I try to not let myself go there about like, how would things be different for me? How would I be different? Um, because that takes me to a really dark place. And it's it's hard to wrestle with that. You know, I can't go back and it is something that happened. And do I necessarily think that like I'm better for it? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I think it caused a lot of harm. And I think it caused a lot of things that have permanently changed who I am. Um, and, and, and I have to live with that today. And I do. And I find ways to deal with it. But I also think a lot of it was very avoidable. Um, it caused fracturing in my family that is also something that, sorry, this part just makes me really sad. Um, you know, it's hard because when I got out of the program, I was only at home for about nine months. And then um, my mom had kicked me out of the house. And so I was 17 living on my own. And so I, when I look back and I think really the last time that my mom was a parent to me was when I was 14. You know, that was the last time before I went to the program that I would actually see her in that parent role and, and that she would get to be a parent to me too. And so um, that's hard. That's hard. You know, it's time lost that like neither of us will ever get back. And it's taken a lot since then for me to let her in and to have that relationship there. And, you know, it's something that we're, we're still working on. And like I've said, like, we've made a lot of progress. And, you know, I love my mom deeply. But the program fucked us up. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that answered your question. I know I kind of went off on the thing, but... It, yeah, would I do it all over again? Absolutely not. I would do anything in the world to turn back time and be able to just have a normal life. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about after you got out of the program and then also talk about like your activism and stuff like that. So sure. like what what do you remember about like well first of all, did they give you a life contract? Yes, I did have a life contract and I actually still have a copy of it. And it's a little scary, um, especially considering these were some of the things that I wrote about who I could hang out with, who I could talk to, um, what I was allowed to wear, what, a lot, what music I was allowed to listen to, um, at what point I would be allowed to, you know, go out with my friends and what my curfew was. It was very, very, very strict and conservative um and when we got home i think maybe we followed it for like two weeks it did not last we did not follow the life contract at all did did they do um any sort of big graduation ceremony when you graduated from the program did they have did, are, did, you, did you guys have trail of lights like is that a familiar term for you guys because it's i i, I seem to th i've been finding more and more that this is only a Spring Creek thing that they did, the tra the, tr the crowd surfing and the, the blindfolding you for the day that you're graduating and the whole thing. Did they do anything like that? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I feel like I have maybe some memory gaps with exactly what happened for our graduation. They didn't do that, but they did something kind of I don't, I don't i don't know if it's similar or not but they so at the facility before we left because we were like pc3 for us is graduation and so before we left for pc3 they brought all of us into what we called the seminar room right just like a massive room and we um people went around and gave us all feedback right everyone who was graduating and like the feedback that they would give of course was all things like you know, my experience of myself when I'm around you is like, I love you so much. And I'm like, so sad that you're leaving. And, you know, so it'll be things like that. Like, I hope you do so good out there. I'll miss you. 
Um, and uh, so I know we did that. That stuck with me very vividly. And then I like, honestly don't really remember PC3 all that much. Um, I know, you know, it was supposed to be kind of celebratory and setting guidelines for when you get home. Um, but other than that, I, I don't remember a whole lot about PC3. <clears throat> yeah, ours was the same way. Trail of Light was essentially an all-day process. They blindfolded you, and then you had to follow people's voice. And usually it's with a bigger group of people, but since I was the last graduating person, there's only one other person graduating with me. So you, back in the old days, they would have you hike up a mountain with a blindfold on and then hike back down the mountain and then do all these like weird, like crazy like processes where like they have like your parents write an obituary for you, like as if you died and da 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 da. Like I will, it's supposed to represent like the old you dying and you like being born again. And so then they do this like crowd surfing thing where you get to pick a song. And I swear that it was only Spring Creek that they did this crowd surfing thing. And, but then at the end, they did like a thing where they had everybody come around you and like whisper in your ear, like how you impacted their program and like, oh, I'm gonna miss you so much. So it sounds like they did something like, like that, but they didn't, They, I haven't heard any other school doing the crowd surfing thing with the music besides Spring Creek. And it's very, it's very crazy. It, that's interesting. interesting and I feel like it it sounds familiar to me like I want to say they did something like that like I do maybe remember an element of being blindfolded I'll have to ask some people that I graduated with and see if they remember um but yeah I don't know that's the weird thing about the program is that it causes I feel like so many kind of gaps in memory of like what did happen there um but yeah I remember they made graduation a big deal I mean, it was hell getting through that program, so it should have been a big deal. But, you know, it it was not what any of us actually needed. And I can't stress this enough that I think the greatest harm that the TTI has done to people, I don't want to say the greatest because the TTI has done some pretty fucked up things, but mm -hmm. it, it, it deprives people of the ability to actually get maybe the treatment or help that they actually needed if they needed it right i know there were some people in our program that like they didn't need to be there they were coming from an abusive home environment and this was just an, an extension of that abuse you know but like i'll speak for myself our family needed support our family needed help we needed resources we needed someone to come in and help us and instead we got this and and like there's no do-overs right we can't do that over we spent two and a half years working this program and it, it, it turned out to be utterly devastating to my life and to my family. And I can't help but, you know, kind of going back to your previous question, I can't help but think how different things may have turned out if we actually had someone who could have helped us in the right way that we needed it. For sure, definitely. <clears throat> All right, so you you do the life contract and then you're heading home <clears throat> did they tell you that you were going home how did how did like getting home happen so if i remember correctly they had kind of a process for telling you when you qualified for like pc1 pc2 or pc3 so when it's announced that you qualified for pc3 you essentially know that you're going home at that point um, things at Ivy Ridge, at least in my experience, started to be really kind of loosey-goosey. So I know as graduates, we were allowed to do a lot more off-grounds activities or do a lot more things that we wouldn't typically be allowed to do, like kind of walking around in places that we usually wouldn't be allowed to be, or, you know, places without staff or staff letting us use their little, you know, sensors to unlock doors. And so um, I, I remember them announcing that I qualified for PC3 and like it's a big it's a big moment, you know, you get to go home. Um, and so we flew out to San Diego for PC3. And then after that, we just went home. And I. Let me think. My mom at that time had relocated from. Well, she had moved around to a bunch of different places while I was in the program, but ultimately she had settled in Western Massachusetts. 
And so um, it was a long drive to like this new house that I had never been to before. Um, and like when I walked in to my new bedroom at the time, I had, you know, never been there, never seen it. Um, you know, my family had made like sent me gifts and, you know, like welcome home. And it was like a really, really big deal. Um, but at that time, my mom was not in a good place. Um, she had been dealing with like really acute um, panic attacks, like daily panic attacks. And this was before people really knew or talked about panic or anxiety. And so she was just constantly going through this feeling of she was having a heart attack and she was dying. And um, at the same time, she had moved into um, this house with the boyfriend that she originally had moved to South America with. And so I believe it was about three weeks before I came home, they had a really horrible breakup. So I came back to my mom um, dealing with agoraphobia and not wanting to leave the house. She was having multiple, multiple panic attacks a day. Um, she just went through this nasty breakup and now she was stuck with this insane mortgage that she couldn't afford on her own because she didn't have a job. So all of a sudden we're going through all of this financial stress. And then at the same time, I get told that I can't go back to high school because they won't take any of my credits. And so it, I think it was within about four or five months of me being home. Um, my mom and I were actually living out of her Jeep with our three dogs. And I was trying to kind of continue on with a normal life somewhat, as wild as that sounds. Sorry, go ahead. Now, how old were you when you graduated? Were you 16 and a half, 17? How old? I was about 16 and a half. Okay. Just trying and to first, first perspective. Yeah, so I was sent there when I was 14. I had just turned 14. And then I got out when I was about 16 and a half. Okay. And so, you know, it was really hard. Um, I had finally kind of made some friends at that point. And I remember them asking, like, why are we always just, like, dropping you off in a parking lot somewhere with your mom? Like, why don't we ever just take you home? Because they had cars at the time. You know, they were 16, 17, and 18. And um, I just remember being so embarrassed, you know. And it was just a world of stress. It was not what I thought I was coming home to. I thought I was coming home and going to a normal high school and I, I could finally like carry on with life. So then all of a sudden to be like confronted with all of these other challenges that are, would be an extreme challenge even for an adult to go through, an adult who had not been to a TTI program, um, but getting out after being institutionalized <laughs> for that long and then also on top of that kind of dealing with this stress, um, I don't really know how I made it through that time. It, it was especially challenging. Um, and so, you know, eventually because of everything going on at home, I started making this plan for when I turned 18 because my 18th birthday was coming up relatively soon. And I started making this plan for when I turned 18. I'm like, when I turn 18, I'm gonna get an apartment. You know, really what I was looking for was just like stability and knowing that like I'm safe in my environment. And, and it seemed like moving out of my mom's house uh, and getting my own place was like the only way to do that. So I started, um, I, I actually got a job uh, at the time and I was able to, you know, start making a little bit of money. I don't know what it was at the time. It was probably something ridiculously low, but I, I was able to start making some money. And I started like buying um, like kitchen sets for my new future apartment. And I was excited about it. And I would talk to my mom about it. And I think looking back now, I didn't know this at the time, but I think it actually just like really hurt her feelings that I would get home and all of a sudden be wanting to move out again. And, uh, but she didn't say that at the time. Instead, she got super pissed off at me one day. And she was like, you want to move out? Like, move move out. You want to get out? Like, fine, you're gone. Like, go pack your stuff. You've got an hour and I will drop you off at your work and just, like, move out then if you want to move out. 
you were living in the car at this time still, right? So we had gotten back into our house. So what had happened, um, just a little bit more detail in case this is confusing. So we um, were at risk of our house being foreclosed. And so my mom um, had rented it out to some people who were vacationing over the summer. And so we were able to rent our house out um, for, I think, like three or four months. And during that time, we lived in our Jeep. And so when that was up, we got back into our house. But still, it was like everything that she had made on renting the house out was like exactly what was needed just to pay the mortgage. So we like there were there were no extra funds after that. Once we got back into the house, it was still like, how are we going to stay here this month? How are we going to stay here the next month? You know, incredibly stressful. And like, honestly, my mom did absolutely everything to like figure that out at the time while she was dealing with her own mental health stuff. Um, but as a kid, it was just like beyond me on how to manage any of that. And it just, um, quite frankly, was very scary seeing my mom go through, you know, these kinds of panic attacks every day. Um, the agoraphobia on top of it, not wanting to leave the house, like having kind of some OCD tendencies, you know, like checking the stove multiple times, checking the front door multiple times, like, which was also a part of her panic and anxiety. Um, and so... Anyway, so yeah, so my mom had, um, you know, kicked me out and I luckily found a place to stay with a friend and I lived there until I was able to get a place of my own until after I turned 18. Uh, and it was just a lot of life to figure out. You know, I had zero life experience. I mentally was still like 14, right? Like life experience wise, I was still 14. And here I am like figuring out how to pay taxes um, what I need to do to get a car, uh, buying or pay, paying for classes for people to come pick me up and teach me how to drive at that point. You know, it was a lot, a lot, a lot to navigate on my own. And I think all of that stress built up on top of just like not knowing how to exist in the world as a normal person because I had been institutionalized for so long. And so I ended up... Um, like falling into substance use. And that took me out pretty hard for about seven years. And- um, What was your DOC? Um, so it kind of changed over the years. You know, when I first had started using, it was uh, cocaine. And then, like, and I think this is the story with a lot of people, right? Like, it kind of starts out as, like, I'm partying. I'm partying. It's only on the weekends. It's only at night. It's only with, like, a certain group of people. And we're, like, dancing. And it's a party. And it's fun. Um, and then, you know, that lasted about a year. And then I went and got into a really abusive relationship. Um, physically abusive. Mentally abusive. All of it. And all of a sudden, both used, were you guys both using drugs? Yes. He, okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. And so after being hospitalized from an especially, uh, especially explosive night, um, that using turned into wanting to numb, wanting to escape, wanting to, you know, it was self-harm, right? It, it was absolute self-destruction. I stopped caring. Um, and that's when things got especially, you know, scary for me. Um, it, it was not partying anymore. It was daily dependence. It was waking up first thing in the morning, not being able to get out of bed without it. It was um, being in such a deeply awful, dark depression about everything, you know, about the TTI, about my life sense, about my family, about, you know, that especially traumatic relationship like had all kind of compounded to this moment. Um, and like, I'm truly, truly actually very lucky to be alive. Um, there were several overdoses. There were several trips to the hospital, you know. <laughs> you, uh, uh, go ahead, finish, finish what you're saying, actually. Go ahead and finish that thought. Well, and so what I, I'm sorry, what I, I feel like I left out actually was, um, so my drug of choice then changed to opiates. Okay. And so it was, you know, 
Percocets. It was heroin. It was whatever I could get my hands on. And, um, you know, I wish I could say that <laughs> I was able to turn things around. Um, I, I wasn't, I was actually like, you know, they say like when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, like you'll make the change, you know, when, when you hit your rock bottom, like you'll, you'll, you know, be able to turn things around and get yourself the help that you need. Well, I, again, had no resources, no family really at that time. Um, I had nothing. And so I, you know, had through that experience gone through several more bouts of homelessness and, um, I finally just was like, I've got to get out of Massachusetts. Like, I need to leave this state if I want to get clean and do something better. Um, and so I moved to Oklahoma and I ended up just switching addictions once I got here. I really underestimated how difficult withdrawal off of opiates would be. And so I, you know, tried to just do it on my own. And that didn't work out. And so I started drinking and then like that wasn't filling the void. And then I started, you know, doing uppers and it, um, I actually like had to lose everything, everything. I remember one day and this was kind of the moment that I realized, um, I need to do something about this. Uh, I was walking down the street. I didn't have a place to live at the time. I had no phone, no car. Everything that I owned was literally in a bag on my back. And I just thought to myself, like, if someone came and scooped me up, up off the street right now, like, no one would know for weeks, probably, right? Like, no one would know. And that's really when I realized, like, not only that I still loved myself, like all of a sudden that kind of like little, 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 tiny little calling from inside myself that was like, hey, you don't want to die. <laughs> like you actually might love yourself. Um, you need to do something. Uh, I, I finally was able, I, I went to another treatment program. And what's, what's funny, not funny, haha, but ironic is that when I first got to this um, treatment program, I it triggered the hell out of me. And I didn't really, at that time, I hadn't even started dealing with my TTI trauma. So I didn't know why it just, like, I couldn't stay there. I ended up leaving. I was there for like, it was a six month program. I was there for 24 hours and I left. I was like- You're telling me I can't leave? Okay, I'm out of here. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, well, and the other part too is I, I smoked cigarettes at the time. And so I was just like craving a cigarette more than anything. And they, they didn't allow us to have cigarettes in this program. And so um, I was like, you know, I don't know why I just like didn't do outpatient this whole time. Like why do it? I think I needed inpatient. I'm just going to go and do outpatient and I'll be fine and I'll make it through this. And that led to another six months of me just not doing well. Um, I did, of course I didn't go to outpatient. That was ridiculous. I didn't even have a car. I didn't even have like a means to like make that happen. And so I finally, again, went back to the same treatment program and I ended up completing the program and I will be celebrating, um, 10 years, uh, of my clean time next month. So 10 years clean up everything. <clears throat> How do you define everything? Yeah, <laughs> are we talking, I, 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 are we talking I'm California, California clean? California sober. I smoke weed, <laughs> but I'm also, full disclosure, I'm on methadone, but I'm also, um, <clears throat> I'm working to get off of it. And uh, I only have to go once a week. Um, but I have two years and seven months and counting on off of uh, opiate. Or my thing was, uh, was um, goofballs and I injected, so. I didn't inject the entire time, but that was like my thing towards the end. So um, I, I shouldn't be alive either. Like I'm like, I should be a um, statistic. Like I should have been dead a long time ago, but for some reason I'm still here. And uh, one of the reasons I am like so passionate about what I do and like doing this podcast and whatnot, because like, uh, I don't know, I've been through a lot and I want to give back to people. And it's just like, Especially with the program, like I literally should have been a statistic because there's so many people that like 
got out of these programs, got addicted to drugs, and just never got out of it and ended up overdosing because of that. Yeah. So, it, um, you know, it's crazy now. Like, um, back at the time, I was actually using fentanyl. <clears throat> And it, um, I like actually had overdosed so many times that I've lost count. And I look back now and I, I've lost several friends um, since then to fentanyl overdoses. And of course, we know what an issue it is in the world right now. And, um, and, and also, I just want to say congratulations to you. You know, it, it is like those little steps and don't discredit your sobriety with methadone it you like i fully believe in you know medical interventions to be able to make that transition like you actually have to i think um and anyone who doesn't you're setting yourself up for such a hard road you know i went through that withdrawal um experience off of opiates and it made it so much longer and harder because like i said i ended up then using alcohol i then ended up filling the void, you know, with something else because I was in so much like actual physical pain from um, those withdrawals. So like, congratulations to you. And, you know, it, uh, it s sobriety and I like, I don't even like saying sobriety or like clean, right? Because I'm, I'm like California sober and um, like sometimes I'll have a drink, but it is also very, a very different experience now right? Like I'm not drinking because I hate myself. I'm not like drinking until I black out. It's not, you know, and I feel like a lot of people, unfortunately, in the recovery community are so black and white. It's like, oh, no, you had a drink. Like you're, you're no good. You know, I'm sorry. I'm just not about that. Like I do believe that people recover. And for myself, a lot of it was dealing with my actual trauma. It was de dealing with the things I needed to deal with to get myself in a different headspace so I wasn't constantly wanting to escape from myself um, and my life, you know? So, um, yeah, I don't know. I Just to reiterate that again, I hate that black and white thinking. I cannot stand it. Um, and I think that a lot of people don't enter recovery because they see it as an all or nothing kind of thing, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate, you know? And some people never make it out because of that. I also, uh, with the black and white thinking, I might, like, and I'm probably going to catch flack for this, but <clears throat> at least some flack, and that's fine to disagree. But um, I'd even say that, like, a relapse isn't even a full relapse until you've done it for two or more days, or, like, two or more times. Because to me, it's like, and also I will say a caveat with that, like, I don't think it's okay to just beat yourself the fuck up if you have one fuck up, especially if you're an ex-addict. Like, you have one fuck up, and you're going to beat yourself up and put yourself right back into the fucking gutter you were just in, and then continue using drugs because you're beating yourself up. It's like, I don't think that's the right thing. Like, you used once, you fucked up, okay? You don't even have to call it a relapse. I don't even call it, I say it's a fucking hiccup, okay? I hiccuped, right? Haven't, I literally, I've had fucking... I, I don't even know if I'd call it a hiccup. Like, I, my friend had some coke and I fucking literally, like, gummed it. And that was all I did. And I was like, I don't even want this. Like, what did, like, it just, like, made me mad. I was like, I don't even want, like, this isn't what I want. And so, like, I've had a hiccup, but that's not even doing drugs. So, like, I don't even, like, I think we need to redefine, like, what we consider, like, you know, like, a full-fledged relapse. Like, did you really, like, you know, end up doing it for, like, two or three days in a row and not slept? And, like, you know, like, you're not taking care of yourself. Like, I think there need to be, like different like categories like yeah there's always going to be black and white thinking like yeah you relaxed you know like da, da, da. but it's like i think there need to be like categories to like determine because i don't think it's safe to just beat yourself up because you fucked up one time like you know what i, I mean i agree and i think for everybody it's such a personal thing it really is such a personal thing i mean i know that i've talked to people who are like <laughs> Uh, and not to belittle this, because I know this is truly a problem in some people's lives, but it's just a vastly different experience than my own. But like, there's some people who are like, oh yeah, I knew that I had a problem when I was drinking every weekend. And they're like, I would just go out on the weekends and I would get blackout and like, I was an alcoholic. And I'm like, okay. Like, you know, but I, I, I also think, you know, it just wasn't, that wasn't the case for me. It was so much more than that. It was like 10 a.m. in the morning. It was like, you know, it, so much other destructive things around it. And so I, I, 
hate in the recovery space that we have those kinds of like definitions of who's clean and who's not, who's sober and who's not. Like, do you have to start your clean time completely over, you know, because you had a hiccup? Like, I think that's going to depend on you. You know, do you feel like your life was starting to spiral out of control again? Do you, and, and not to say that like, if you manage your drug usage, you're fine. I don't want to say that at all, but it's like, it is just something that's so deeply personal. And I, I don't think anyone else can put a label on that and that it's got to come from, from you, you know, um, it is, you know, I, oh gosh, let's see, this was probably about seven and a half or eight years ago. Um, I had a miscarriage and I was um, 17 weeks into the pregnancy. And so at that point, you like actually have to go through labor. And the whole thing was extremely traumatizing. Um, I was very excited to be pregnant and to have a child. And, um, and it was just, it was just an awful time. And I, I just felt uh, very hollow. And I didn't know how to sort through those emotions at the time. And so I had talked to a friend of mine who was like, oh, yeah, I can get some um, like lore tabs or something. I can get some lore tabs. And I was like, deal. And like I even went, I picked them up. I was like fully ready. Like I was going to do it. Like I wanted nothing more than to experience that again. And as I sat there with it, though, it was like, uh... I don't actually want to do this. I actually don't want to do this. It's going to make things so much worse. And I, I do, so I ended up flushing them down the toilet. But um, I, I think that in recovery, you truly do reach a period of time where using again would not just be using, it would be emotionally devastating to do it again. You know, it becomes so far removed from like your life today that actually there's probably not anything that could happen to me today that would send me back to that place. Like, does that make sense? Like you really do get so far away from, from, from that experience that like it, it just ends up. And, and I know there's people who relapse after 15 years or 20 years or whatever. This is just my own personal experience with it. You know, like, I don't know if there's something that devastating that could happen in my life um, that would send me back to that place. But, you know, knock on freaking wood. <laughs> I, I never want to be back there again, you know? I always say it's going to be when my dad passes away. And I've said that for fucking years because I'm really close to my dad. But the fact that I know that that's going to be a difficult time for me, my mom knows that's going to be a difficult time for me. She said I'm going to get there as, as quickly as I can to even whatnot. It's just like, I don't, I don't feel like I need to, re like, I feel like I don't need to relapse over that. You know what I mean? I don't feel like it's a good thing. Like I want to also with my dad's, I want to honor his memory. So I don't want to like piss on his grave by doing that. You know what I mean? I feel like it'd just be a big fuck you. You know, like I was yeah, so he wouldn't want that. He wouldn't want that for you. <laughs> that would be the last thing that he would want for you. You know? Yeah. I feel that. So, I feel that. but I also feel like, uh, just cause it needs to be said because people, you know, probably gonna, I'm probably gonna get a little bit of backlash for saying what I said anyways, but, um, there's also people that can not smoke weed one time and just like just smoke weed. They they smoke weed and then they go and do coke and then they go and shoot up heroin. It's like so for some people they just can't do anything like at all. And for some and people it's super destructive. It's just super personal and go by your own gut and intuition. That's what I'm gonna tell people. Like, don't go by what I tell you to do. Please don't. Just you know, what works for me may not work for you. So. And that's exactly it. Everyone is so individual i mean so like for me i a lot of it has to be about the intention right am i having a glass of wine because i've had a really stressful day and i just want to escape and like i'm not you know i'm feeling so much stress or pressure like that actually is probably not very good for me um is it you know and i know this is so normalized but is it in more of like a social setting where we're like at a dinner and i'm going to have one glass of wine with a steak and go home um, and you know, I, I don't know. I, it, it just, you've got to be so in tune with yourself and know those emotional triggers, you know, that it is about, am I wanting to detach from myself right now and why, <laughs> and what else do I have in place to like actually deal with those feelings? 
um, you know, when they can get the best of us sometimes, right? Like they say, oh gosh, what do they say? That like, you know, addiction is conniving. Like we will lie to ourselves and we will put ourselves in situations where, you know, we think it's acceptable and then it, it does send us back down on that road. But yeah, it, it for me, it is truly just time has been my greatest ally. You know, I've, I've now had almost a decade of clean time and that was longer than I was using. And so it's like, it, that life has just gotten very far from where I'm at now. And I'm grateful beyond words for that. There were a lot of days that I didn't think I would ever make it out. Um, there were a lot of days that I just didn't want to make it out. I was fine with the way I was living and, and I didn't want to quit. Um, and then, you know, eventually, yeah, when I was like homeless and had nothing and had no money. And I remember being at, uh, I think I was at Family Dollar one day and I was trying to get something that maybe was like $3 and some change. And I didn't have enough. Uh, and I remember there was a panhandler there and he was like, oh, I got you. And he ended up like paying for whatever it was. And it was like so many experiences like that of just feeling completely desperate with nothing gets really old. <laughs> it gets really, really old. It's like, I just want to have have what I need <laughs> to live, to survive, to have food, you know, and in that sense, I think going through poverty is is also extremely traumatizing. And I, I can't stress this enough, how connected all of this is back to being in the program, right? The program normalized being in controlling and abusive relationships. And so what did I do when I got out? I ended up being in abusive and controlling relationships. Um, the TTI had caused so much uh, internal dissociation and trauma and stress that when I got out, I didn't know how to deal with those feelings. Um, I, I had complex PTSD that I was unaware of. And so, you know, what did I do? I self-medicated. I did the only thing that allowed me to, um, in a sense, be present or be in my body without feeling like I wanted to jump out of my skin. You know, and I know there's so many survivors who go through that same experience. And I just hope that through sharing my story, that we can start to shed that shame around being a troubled teen or a troubled adult. Um, you know, so many of those behaviors are just responses to trying to survive. <clears throat> totally. Okay, I have one question, then I want to go into like your activism and like stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> If I can remember what I what I was just gonna ask. Um, sure. Damn it. Okay, it slipped my mind. It might come back to me. Let's let's start on um, your activism and like. Well, so you're addicted to drugs and whatnot. Let's focus on like uh, getting out of that and like how did you turn your life around? And then talk about like how you got into activism and like how people can possibly help if they wanted to. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, so like I said, I ended up going to a six month. Um, treatment program. Um, it really helped me get on my feet, um, helped me get clean. And after that, like life was still not easy for a while. Um, I, because when I went into that treatment program, like I mentioned, didn't have a house, didn't have a car, didn't have any money. Um, when I got out, I also had to deal with those same issues. And so I ended up living at a church housing um, for another six months. And at that time, I was on all kinds of different, you know, government assistance programs. I was on food stamps. I was on a program called TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And I think they gave me like $250 a month to live on. And I, it was the most headstrong I had ever felt in my life about making something of my life. I didn't know how I was going to pull myself out of it, but I was like, I'm just going to one foot in front of the other, figure this shit out. Um, I got back in school and things just kind of incrementally coming together. So I was finally able to get an apartment, finally bought a vehicle. And at that time, I had met someone who worked for the Oklahoma Department of Mental Health. And because of what I had experienced with addiction and everything else, I really knew at that point in my life that I just wanted to help people. And so um, 
when I met this person from the Department of Mental Health, they had offered me a job and it truly was like my dream job at the time. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in mental health. I wanted to help people. And so I stayed with the Department of Mental Health for six or seven years. And I worked in a number of different positions while I was there, but I ultimately ended up working in um, public policy and also um, investigations and advocacy. And so that really exposed me to how state government um, runs facilities and runs programs and how we oversee those programs, how we investigate them, um, and also how we enact public policy um, and just kind of like state government as a whole. So um, I then went on to work for a couple of different places, also somewhat in the public policy space. And so then when I had heard, and this was about a year before Paris came out with her documentary, we had, you know, kind of rumors started circulating that there was going to be this big global celebrity who was coming out with a documentary about the TTI. And that's when it kind of everything opened up with dealing with my troubled teen industry experience. Um, I would not recommend anybody do this. Please don't do this. But this is what I did. I got out all of my letters. I got out all of my pictures I had from the program, my binders, my journals. And just for like several days, I just sat in my living room and read everything and just like cried my fucking eyes out. And I actually ended up not in a great place mentally. I like reached out to any therapist I could. I called like literally every single therapist in my city and couldn't get into anybody. I was like, I need to deal with this because uh, like it, it just opened up everything. Right. Uh, and so that like the way that I deal with things is I'm like, I have to do something about this. Like, I can't just accept that this happened to me and just move on. Right. And I, I, like, I, this is something that's so wonderful. I think about our community is that we have a lot of people who are like that. Right. We're like, no, <laughs> like, no, this is not okay. We have to do something about this. And at the time I had started a podcast called inside the program and interviewed a lot of people, heard their stories, um, and at that time also kind of started doing some like research policy work, um, you know, cause really I just wanted to figure out like, how was this legal that what happened, you know, what happened to me? How was, how was this totally legal? Um, the guy who owned Ivy Ridge, uh, did not have any kind of history in child development or psychology. Um, the, the facility itself was, unlicensed, unregistered with the state, didn't have any kind of accreditation or credentials. Like it really was just a guy who bought this building and had a website and like told parents, send me your kids, you know? And to me, I'm like, there, there has to be something about this that is illegal. Um, and so that was kind of the first year of my journey. Um, when Paris's documentary came out, as um, a lot of us know, like there started to be a lot of momentum about change and about bringing awareness to this issue. And so, um, you know, because of my experience with uh, public policy, I ended up getting connected with um, Paris's team and things kind of went from there. Um, we worked on our first bill in Utah. Um, and just throughout the, you know, course of the past several years, we've worked on legislation in a lot of different states, whether that's actually passing legislation or um, preventing a bill from being passed. And so, um, you know, where am I going from here? So ultimately, um, we were, uh, had applied for a program called Rise Justice Labs. And it is a legislative accelerator program. And it's ran by a woman named Amanda Wen. And Amanda is actually has been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. She has passed, I think they're in their like 60, over 60 bills. Um, they've, they've done a lot. Um, and so they kind of helped, you know, guide us 
in, in how to introduce our federal bill. Um, and so we've been working on the Stop Institutional Child Abuse Act now for uh, over two and a half years. And that bill has gone through a lot of iterations as we continue to really learn more about like the complexity of this industry. Um, it, it's, it's actually not as easy as just like outlawing certain things um, because to outlaw something, you first have to define the industry. Um, and the industry has changed a lot since I originally had gone into the program. So some, some of these programs now, I mean, they qualify for Medicaid dollars. They qualify for all of these public funding sources. Um, and, and not only that, but they're kind of defined differently from state to state. So uh, addressing this issue on the federal level, we really have to do a few things first. And one of the first things that we have to do is we have to build a system of accountability on the federal level. So like the federal government actually does not keep like a database of these facilities. They don't even know where they are. And so that, that's really kind of where we have to start is by making sure that the federal government has a database where they know where these facilities are, they know what's happening in these facilities, and then we can start to build out further systems of accountability. Um, as far as creating like uh, standards of care, minimum licensing requirements that can be implemented at the state level. Um, so, you know, SICA has received some criticism um, in, in that some people believe that it's not as heavy hitting as it could be. And I understand that disappointment because when we first entered this space, we had a really heavy hitting regulatory bill. Um, but the issue is, is you don't want to just pass a bill that actually can't be implemented, right? Like you, you want to start with the square one, <laughs> with the first steps to make sure that further action <clears throat> can actually be done. Um, so I'm really excited about SICA. The other great thing about SICA, and I promise I won't go on and on and on about SICA because I definitely could. Um, but the other great thing about SICA is that the whole bill is built around reducing placements altogether, keeping kids in their community, and bolstering community-based care. And so like, like that's what we need, right? We have to break this pipeline of kids being sent to institutions, period. If we just look at the um, programs themselves, we're never going to stop that pipeline. And in order to stop that pipeline, we have to make sure that there are community level resources for kids and families who do need some kind of help or intervention. Um, so, so SICA is starting that process. Um, and there's a few different ways that you can get involved. Um, number one, if you would uh, sign up for our newsletter on our website, you can go to stopinstitutionalchildabuse.com, sign up for our newsletter that way. And this is how we're going to communicate about everything. So whether we're working on a state bill <clears throat> and we um, want to engage with survivors who maybe went to a program in that state, that mailing list is how we're going to be able to communicate those needs. Um, so I will say this next year, there are a number of states who are interested in taking legislative action on the industry. And so we'll have some really cool state level opportunities coming up. And then um, SICA will actually be moving pretty aggressively throughout the rest of this year. And just to give a little update with that, um, we currently have a really good number of co-sponsors on the bill, but we're wanting to get um, even more original co-sponsors signed on to the bill. And once we get a number that we feel like is pretty good that shows a, a really good general support for the bill, um, we're then going to be having a committee hearing. This committee hearing is going to be powerful for a number of reasons. Number one, we can actually call the industry to the stand um, to testify and account for the things that they're currently doing. Um, and also it will be a space for survivors to have their voices heard. So we're excited about that committee hearing. And if you're wanting to get involved, sign up for our newsletter, letter, excuse me, letter, all calls to action will be put out through that way. So <clears throat> it's exciting. It's good stuff. <clears throat> okay. I had one person had asked, or there, there were a couple of people that were asking about the SICA thing. Um, some people, um, <clears throat> 
like I know from what the way you were saying it, uh, so essentially this is like an introductory bill to get the foot in the door so we can do more actions later, right? So I, I don't want to frame it quite like that because SICA is going to do quite a bit on its own. So I want to avoid getting in a position where it's like SICA is just the first step. SICA is going to accomplish quite a bit. Um, They're going to build a database. They're going to build, you know, uh, minimum requirements for care. Um, they are going to uh, do an analysis of what federal dollars are going into these facilities so we can start to cut off some of those um, federal funding sources. So I anticipate that there will be very much be follow-up action from SICA, but I, I just also want to avoid saying SICA is just the first step and it's there's more on the way. What I am saying is that on the federal level, we cannot just cut to doing a regulatory bill and regulating the industry quite yet. Um, there's no way to enforce it. How would the feds know if the facilities are following it or not. Like there's just not a system that's created there yet, which is why we really have to start with building out that database. Do we, uh, if if this bill is passed, do we know yet what the next steps would be? Like after that, or de- like has that been discussed? Yeah, so um, w- the other, one of the other things that I really love about SICA is that um, one of the main programs that our working group that's created in SICA will do. Um, so let me let me back up maybe for folks who aren't so familiar um, with it. So the bill is going to create a working group. And that working group is going to be comprised of all the different federal agencies that oversee children's placements in these facilities. So we're talking the administ- administration for children and families. There's representatives from HHS, from um, Um, excuse me, from um, the juvenile justice agencies, um, from child welfare. Like it's, um, so those representatives will create what is this working group. The working group will also consult with survivors, child advocates, attorneys, um, and other folks who are stakeholders in this space. Um, And so that working group is going to create uh, best practices, right? So this is everything from reducing restraint and seclusion, um, access to education, um, reporting abuse that happens in these facilities, and of course, like preventative measures like training staff or um, making sure that there's even kind of a credential for that facility, because we know some facilities are not licensed or credentialed by any means. Um, So then what they're going to do with those best practices that they make, they are going to work with the Department of Health and Human Services, and they're going to start training the states on those issues, right? So, you know, one of the things that we want to do is reform in all 50 states, and this will actually be one of the fastest ways to do that, is having HHS directly work with states to implement those best practices. Um, Does that make sense? Is that, I try to explain it in kind of a way that's simple, um, but, uh, so that's one of, I'm sorry, remind me, can you ask me your question again? I kind of got off on that. I was like, what were we getting? I had to explain that for something, but what was your initial question? Um, so initially, uh, so after this bill gets passed, like, uh, has like the next steps been discussed yet? Okay. Like, what yeah. do next? Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So that's what you asked. So, so the next steps will largely be dependent upon what this working group finds, Um, There's also a study that's uh, involved with this bill, and that study, um, as I mentioned earlier, they're going to do a complete analysis of how many federal dollars are going into these programs, what are the funding streams. Um, Right now, there's no collection of any of that information, so it makes it kind of hard to figure out what money can be cut off from those placements if we don't even know really on paper what dollars are going into the facilities. Um, and so so based off of the findings from the study and the work that the working group will do, um, we'll then be able to determine like what needs to come next. But I also anticipate that we're going to have a lot of state engagement um, as this work begins to roll out. And I might need to plug in my computer here in a second. It's like flashing at me that my battery's low. 
Um, but I also think that we'll have a lot of state engagement and we've already seen that already. State legislatures are seeing the work that we're doing. And, and when I say we, I, I truly mean our entire community. Um, like the awareness that's being brought by people who are doing podcasts like yourself, um, folks who are on social media, people who are doing interviews with media outlets, documentaries, like all of that is putting this issue on the map and it is getting the attention of lawmakers and they're wanting to do something about it. Um, so I, I, I really hope um, by this time next year, uh, there's a lot more action that's being taken and I hope our community as a whole feel, I just hope that we're in a better place where people feel like there's there's good things that that's happening. Okay, cool. Uh, you can go ahead and prep, plug in your uh, laptop if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, hang on one second. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, thank you. I'm back. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm interested on your take on this. Uh, or actually, before that, when you were in rehab, did you notice any, um, because you went to a rehab, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you notice any, like, weird processes? Or, for example, when I went to rehab, they fucking tried to make me do the lipo process. And I knew instantly what the fuck that was. I was like, I'm not fucking participating in this. You're not. They're like, no, no, it's cool. I'm like, no, this isn't fucking cool. No. <laughs> you don't fucking understand. I was forced to fucking do this shit. And I just walked out. I'm like, you can't fucking force me to do this. I'm not doing it. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's different. It's like, no, I don't fucking care. Like, no, that is wild. Um, so, OK, so they didn't have anything like that. But I think that a lot of the ideology between AA and the TTI can be very, very similar. And so I personally, and I don't want to say this because I don't want to deter anyone from doing AA if that's something that works for them. It works for a lot of people. And I also think it's a very different position when you are an adult and you are a willing participant <laughs> and you're not forced to do anything. Um, so I feel like that alone kind of makes it a little bit of a different thing, but the ideology itself and the connections historically to the TTI are very much alive and well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. I was just curious about that. Yeah, that's so weird. I've never, I, I've heard of other weird things happening in rehab settings that are like eerily similar to the TTI. I didn't experience that. Luckily, the program, um, the program, oh my God, the uh, treatment program that I went to, um, they were actually really above board with a lot of like kind of cutting edge therapy. So we got some pretty, you know, decent trauma therapy out of it. Okay. <clears throat> well, at least you didn't have to do like, at least it wasn't weird or have any sideways stuff thrown to you. That is crazy. Uh, uh, I am curious about what your take on, um, uh, knowing what you know now, is it your belief that these boarding schools that are still open need to be need or even could be fully regulated at this point or do you believe that they should always be shut down like what's your take on that yeah i think that's a great question um so i think that it's so okay i'm going to answer this in a much more complex way than probably is necessary but i think it's important to have this distinction so we have the tti as we know it, right? The TTI is very specific. And these are facilities like Aspen. These are facilities that are mostly in Utah. And like, I don't believe that there's necessarily any level of regulation that's going to make them a good treatment program ever. <laughs> but what I do think what we can do on a policy level, because right now you can 
regulate people enough so it makes it difficult for them to stay in business because essentially you as a program owner should be spending money on making sure that your program is safe right and if they're not able to do that then they're not going to be around um and so from that policy perspective i think there is a world in which we can regulate and we can shut a lot of these places down is there going to be one bill that says shut all of these xyz places down you can't do that right um so we've got to impact it in other ways and that's through awareness that is through people not sending their kids there to begin with because they know that these places are awful right um but there's also kind of another faction of the TTI that has really kind of established itself more um, in the uh, public space as far as receiving kids from the juvenile justice system, kids from foster care. So we're looking more at facilities that are kind of like sequel or embark facilities. And in those facilities, we absolutely 100% have to regulate and make sure that they are safe. Um, as safe as possible and also reallocate public dollars into community-based care. Um, working at that level, you really have to kind of be a little bit more focused on each individual pipeline. So you have to look specifically at child, child welfare laws or specifically at juvenile justice laws. Um, and it's a little bit more difficult to make kind of blanket regulation that way. Um, and when I say regulation, what I mean is like uh, making a law that no child can be institutionalized if they're in the child welfare system, right? Um, so so it, it, it's a complex issue. Um, it is a very complex issue. It, it affects so many different kids from so many different backgrounds. Um, and of course, the most difficult thing to do is to um, impact private placements. It's not impossible. It's difficult. Um, if you have a private business, what's to stop a parent from making that decision to send their child there? And so I always say that this battle, it, it takes place on two different levels. One of them is the policy level and the other is on the cultural level. We have to change the culture, right? We have to change the culture of way, the way that we parent our kids to begin with. And we have to change the way that we culturally think of appropriate care or placement for a child who's experiencing issues, right? That first step should not be sending them away, right? We need to make that culturally taboo where people just don't do that because they know how harmful it is. Um, and, and, and that is something that will be accomplished through, I believe, storytelling, through awareness, through education. Um, so it is, it's a multi, multi-faceted battle. <laughs> Did that answer your question? I hope that got to the point, but it is, yeah. it, it's a its a complex issue and it requires a complex answer. Okay, totally. <clears throat> um, when you were looking for therapists, did you ever find a therapist to deal with your uh, with your trauma? When I was a kid or when I, now no, as an like adult? When you got out of the program and you started dealing with like the, you started uh, having all the program flashbacks and stuff like that. Or was it hard to find a therapist? Because like for me, I've had, I can't count the number of therapists that have told me I don't know how to help you because of the kind of trauma that I've been through. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think that was the most distressing part to me when I first started looking at my TTI trauma is that I really realized that there's not anyone out there who has studied this. There's not anyone out there who has a, treatment method for dealing with a trauma that's like specific to this and um and and so that just felt really distressing right there's not an expertise out there there's no one who i can call um at any university at any level of of care that would know how to address this um and so i luckily was able to get in with a therapist who um it's kind of a funny name um and at first i was like um is this like is this legitimate but she practices something called internal family systems and it helps you deal with these certain parts of yourself that have experienced trauma and it helps you kind of deal with things in a way that is segmented so like this part of myself 
that has been through this TTI trauma is just a part, right? It's not all of me. It, it doesn't take up all of who I am. It's just this part of me that's been traumatized and I can deal with that. And it makes it a little bit more manageable. Breaking um, up trauma so you can deal with it in segments. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, when I went through um, the abusive relationship I mentioned earlier, it's like that is a part of me. It's not all of me. Like I have this core core self that will always be me and has always been me. Um, and the things that have happened to me along the way uh, may have added complexities to who I am, but I'm still fundamentally me, right? And I can deal with this kind of part that's external to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you make uh, a lot of friends in the program? Um, and like, do you still have a lot of relationships from the program to this day? Yeah, I mean, the Ivy Ridge girls and, and, and guys that I um, went to air with our family. Um, you know, when you go through something like that, you are family with these people. It is, yeah, it, it, and luckily I was able to reconnect with a lot of them at the rally in Provo um, that they hosted a couple of years ago, three year, years ago maybe. Um, so I got to see a lot of them, and then we still talk, like, very, very regularly. Okay. <clears throat> with your mom, uh, would you say that you have, because, like, with me and my parents, like, I've forgiven them, but I'll never forget what happened to me. Would you say you've forgiven your mom? Um, do you think you ever could forgive your mom? Where are you with your mom? I know you went over that a little bit, like, but, like, as of, like, today, where are you guys at with the whole seeing eye to eye thing? Yeah, I I think in, in my case, um, my mom was also a victim and she did the best that she could with the information that she had. And, you know, this is part of why um, I, I do believe in regulation, because if there had been a database for my mom to look into or if there had been some kind of reporting requirement for my mom to see what was happening at that facility, um, she would have made a different decision. And so, you know, she didn't have uh, the ability to even access the necessary information that she would have needed to know that was going on. Um, I, I saw one time, this was maybe a year ago, I forget where this was, um, it was some post online and there had been a bunch of program parents who were infiltrating this post. And one of them was saying, um, she was like, well, we've got uh, Facebook groups and all of these programs are vetted and we know that they're good programs because we've done our research. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like you don't understand the information that you need is actually not available. You could do all the research all day long and it's not required to be reported. So you're never going to find it. Like you think that you're making an educated decision because you've looked at Google reviews or whatever. I don't know where where they're even looking for this information, but it's it's just it, it's not possible. Um, so you know, in my relationship with my mom, um, I truly, I really feel for her because she it's a decision that she made that she can never take back, and it's something that she thought was going to help, and it ended up doing the exact opposite. Um, and so again, I think it's just, unfortunately, sometimes you have to live with those things in your life. You know, we we make decisions and they can't be undone in a lot of situations. And that was what is been like for her. Um, it, it's also, I think, been difficult for her to hear about the way that it's impacted my life. Yeah. Um, as I can imagine, you know, I, I have three kids. If I made a decision, that impacted my kid on this kind of level, I don't know if I could live with myself. Um, and I, I think she really battles with a lot of that, but we have a very close relationship. We've been able to talk through a lot of it many times. Um, and she actually sat down for a very lengthy interview um, for our next season of Trapped in Treatment. And so I'm excited for everybody to kind of hear that parental perspective because I think not every TTI kid's parent can own up to what they did and so i just hope maybe my mom's words can provide some healing 
um, for other people. Yeah, I'm going to get my mom <coughs> on the podcast, too. That's awesome. I know that That's she's important. Buying, I told her she's going to get a lot of backlash, probably, just because she's, like, my mom and all this shit. And then she's like, I don't care. My mom's a peace activist. Like, she's a traveling peace activist. She, she's already oh. used to like, the pushback. So. Well, um, if people push back, so be it. I mean, it's it's the real reality that it's like, you know, we all have parents who were a part of that decision, most of us, right? Some some of us ended up in these facilities and, you know, through other means. Um, but it, uh, like, we should, I hope, as a survivor community, be supportive of families that have been able to find healing. And I hope in some ways that we can, you know, like, there was a point in time when my mom was not ready to talk about this. And I had had um, someone on my podcast inside the program and his mom reached out to me after listening to his story. And she was like, you know, thank you so much. Like you've brought our family together. I never understood what had happened there until I heard, you know, his story. And like hearing her say those words was healing to me. Right. Um, and so I, I hope other people can gather that like from your mom's story and, and then hopefully, you know, from my mom's story as well. Um, you know, and I know not everyone's so lucky to have that. And I, I genuinely feel for those people. That's, you know, it's, it's a one-sided healing journey in that case. And that can be really challenging. Sure. <clears throat> what would you say the biggest things you struggle with as a result of the program are? Like for me, I'm always waiting for you to shoot a drop. Um, I fucking like, I, I just, you know, I'm just like, I always feel like shit's going to fucking blow up in my face every time. Um, and maybe that's also from like doing drugs and the whole addiction thing and being homeless. But um, also, I'm just like, um, I never really know like um, who I can trust. I have a hard time trusting people. I have a hard time making friends. I'm no, I'm no, in no way confident. I'm extremely shy. Like I was, yes, I was confident in the program because I was... I was programized and I was like high on the fucking like uh, Kool-Aid, you could, I guess you could say. But um, <clears throat> in the long run, I don't feel like it made me confident and like outgoing. I feel like it made me like shut off and like be like super like, I, I barely leave my house. Like I'm super like withdrawn, I don't have many friends. Like I keep my circle really small. So for me, it's just like, um, it's been really hard. So those are the things that I struggle with. Like what, what do you struggle with? Yeah, I mean, like all of that, I feel that so much. It is like just operating in social situations. I sometimes feel like a little robotic. Um, I'm like, okay, smile, <laughs> laugh at their joke. Don't make too much eye contact. Like, look away. <laughs> like, I just, you know, it's like difficult, I think, sometimes to just like be okay in my skin and to just be myself because we were taught to be anything but ourselves. And I also think spending that amount of time in complete silence with no social interaction with, I mean, it will close you off. And I, previous to the program was very outgoing, definitely would have considered myself to be like an extrovert. And after the program, like I definitely have very reclusive tendencies. I can shut myself off um, and, and kind of speaking to uh, what you said about feeling like the other shoes always going to drop like 100%. Like I always feel like what's next, right? Like it's it, I'm on the verge of a crisis at all times. Um, and it's, it's something I still really have to actively deal with on a daily basis, even to just let myself relax. Like I'll be laying in bed at night. It's 11 o'clock at night. I'm watching a TV show. Everything's good. Our kids are laying in their bed. Like life is fine. Um, not that I don't have my issues or, or you know, life life problems, but generally things are okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I have that feeling of like, oh, there's about to be a tragedy. There's about to be something awful happen. I have to prepare for like this, this awful, awful, like, like truly tragedy, right? Um, and it even plays out in my mind, right? I imagine it happening. I imagine the police coming and knocking on my door saying there's been a terrible accident. I imagine that like all of a sudden my brakes don't work on the highway and I'm like careening into the semi truck in front of me, you know? And it's like a million thoughts like that every day that I really have to actively manage. Um, and I would also say, I think one of the biggest ways that the program has impacted me too 
and this is more in just kind of a practical way and not so much emotional, but um, I, I didn't ever get to finish my education. And it's made it really difficult to go on to college or to go on to have that life that I has always actually been a dream of mine. I wanted so badly to just like go to a really good university and, you know, be an academic. And it's like a struggle now. Um, so I, I hate that I feel like uh, the industry has cut off those opportunities for me. Um, but but yeah, generally, I think a lot of it is in, in social and mental and emotional. Um, and it, it the TTI program caused me to really fragment myself in my mind. Um, so even going back to kind of just like a general feeling of like lack of identity. Who am I? What are my interests? What am I good at? Um, and I feel like during the time frame that I was in the program is really when you start to develop those things as a kid, right? Like you really start to kind of own who you are in your teen years and like figure out those things that you're good at. And, you know, because of the institutionalization and then also the next seven years of like active addiction and then kind of like the stress of rebuilding my life since then, um, I couldn't be focused on like learning how to play an instrument or like getting really good at art or, you know, because I was literally hustling my ass off to make sure that I had food on the table that night. You know, like when you're in survival, you don't get to focus on the things that will make you flourish as a person. Um, so with that being said, like I'm really trying to give myself that now and it it's different it won't be quite the same as if I had experienced it when I was a teenager, but I feel that I owe it to myself. Okay. And uh, I have a couple more questions for you uh, and then we'll be done. Um, how do you, um, <clears throat> how are you now? Like overall, like how are you doing nowadays? Yeah, I love that. Um, I actually feel like I am in the, best place I've ever been in my life as far as feeling sure of myself, as far as being able to deal with some of those anxieties and panic attacks. And um, I, I finally feel like things are manageable and there's a path forward. And that, um, you know, I mean, if you don't have hope in your life and, and things seem to be never ending, um, it, it's really difficult to just like put that one foot in front of the other. Um, so, you know, now I really focus a lot of my time and attention on being the parent that um, I wish I had throughout those years for my kids and making sure that they have every experience and opportunity to blossom as who they want to be. Um, and on top of that, I get to be involved in some pretty cool work that I'm doing and um, I'm really wanting to over the next year to just have more creative pursuits. Um, I love podcasting. I'm brainstorming potentially another podcast uh, coming out. I don't know when, but, you know, fi figuring that out. So I just want to kind of be in a place where I get to create and I get to like enjoy my life and I'm ready to step out of that like constant survival. Um, and, and, you know, it's not easy, right? So many people spend a lifetime in that trap and it truly is a trap. It is so impossibly hard to get out of, um, but, you know, I'm making it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and do, was there anything, like, positive about the program? Like, for me, positives were the relationships and just, uh, just uh, I guess the structure. I guess the structure was sort of a positive, but, like, you know, it's totally fine if there weren't like any positives for you at, um, from the program, but I, I try and like pull out positives whenever I can, even if it's in a super shitty situation. Was there anything like that you saw about that experience that was positive or anything that you took from the program? I mean, I think, you know, Especially I graduated. I wanted to ask you that. Yeah, I, um, you know, the things that I got that were positive from the program 
was not what the program actually intended. <laughs> so what I got from it, as you mentioned, were like relationships. There's a lot of lifelong friendships that I have because of that place and people that I'm so happy just to know. Um, and I think the other positive thing from the program is that it really showed me my mental strength um, through a lot. And so it's kind of one of those things that it's like, well, shit, if I can make it through that, I can make it through anything. Um, and, and so I'm grateful for that. Not that I want to constantly be in a place where I have to be testing my mental strength. Um, but it, it, you know, it's not easy to get through that experience. And it's also not, um, I just want to be clear. I, I don't necessarily believe that any child should have to like go through something like that to know that they're strong. Um, but I mean, if I could take away one thing, that would probably be it. Okay. Okay. And um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> um, did you ever feel weird staffing the seminars? Like, how did you feel about staffing when you were staffing? Did you feel like like bad that you were like facilitating the same things that you went through uh, that were traumatizing to a lot of people? I mean, like at the time, I thought that I got I actually got some shit out of the program. Like at the time, I'm pretty sure I did because I was high off the Kool-Aid. But um, did you ever like how did you feel about staffing for me? Having been on lower levels and rebelling for the first year that I was there, I saw how difficult it could be. I knew how difficult it was when you didn't, when you weren't popular, especially in the families, and you could just get targeted and picked on. And when I was already level one zero points anyways, I'd just get thrown shit all the time from people. So by the time I got up to the upper levels, I was trying to coach people. And so when I'd be in the seminar staffing, while everybody else was like bitching in their ear and saying, oh, you're so horrible, I'd be like, just fucking keep it up. Just like, you, you're almost through this. Just like fucking like, just like keep, like hang in there you're you're gonna get through this you're doing okay like i was just trying to always be there and trying to help people as much as i can in as shitty as this situation as that was so i'm just curious like how you felt staff yeah i think staffing seminars for me and and generally just kind of being an upper level where you were somewhat of like a quasi staff member um i think at the time i i didn't feel weird about it at the time it in hindsight is much harder for me to stomach because you know in some ways or i'll rephrase that i know in some ways that i experienced exposed other people to the abuse that i had also experienced and 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 that can be really difficult um to to stomach so you know i think similar to you i really genuinely believed that i was helping people and in a lot of ways, like I did, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I sat down with people and, and talked to them about their issues and gave them the, the best guidance that I could. And so I, I don't want to negate everything as just being awful because we were in the program and because we were in seminars. You know, I think there genuinely were moments where someone came to me with an issue that they were having with their family or like a personal problem. And like there w is real genuine connection and support happening, you know, and I tried to be in, in that place as much as possible. Um, but, you know, like we literally, you've got to do it to get through the program. There's no way around that. So, um, you know, in that sense, I, I try to show my past self compassion um, because that was the only option we were really given was to be a part of the program or to like never go home. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I feel weirder about it now, definitely, than I, I did when I was there. Okay, and then I have one more question for you and then we're done. Uh, stupidest thing you dropped for? Stupidest thing you, you got dropped for? <laughs> um, okay, stupidest thing. I'm sure there's a lot of ones, like I mentioned, I, I held a record, so I kind of like forget um, all the things that I dropped for, but I remember one that was particularly stupid. And we, um, so I was on the cheer squad when they created this like cheer squad. I was on the cheer squad and one night we were like getting ready for a basketball game that we were having. And it was right around Christmas time. And uh, like they had these Christmas ribbons 
that they were using for something. I don't know. But they were the kind that has like glitter all over them. And so if you rub the uh, ribbon together, all the glitter would come off. And so we thought, how cool would that be if we just like covered ourselves from head to toe in glitter? And so we took these ribbons and we just like, you know, went like this all over. It was like in our hair and like we thought it was so fun. And they ended up dropping the entire cheer squad because they said it was theft. And um, it was terrifying. I mean, because I, I think that was a cat four. And so we were all looking at being like permanently dropped from it. Um, ultimately, I think they ended up giving us a cat three, you know, because the program always like to do that too, right? It's like, you're going to get a cat five. Just kidding. It's actually a cat two. Mm -hmm. And they send you through that emotional turmoil of being like, oh my God, like I'm dropping permanently. And so that's what happened in that situation. But like, I look back now and it's like, it was some fucking ribbon like it was some ribbon and some girls wanted to put some glitter on like why is this being blown up into a massive thing you know but the program's always looking for something to be a problem so yeah that was <laughs> mine the cheer squad was that like i have to ask were there any staff members that were like weird or inappropriate towards you because like the, the cheer squad that kind of sounds kind of like were there like male staff that was watching that was it like kind of like a weird thing was there ever any time when you felt or saw any staff being inappropriate towards any of the students um so not in the context of the cheer squad not from what i witnessed or experienced myself or that i was aware of okay. particularly towards cheer however <laughs> outside of cheer there was definitely inappropriate staff to student relationships happening and you know uh that I, I don't really want to go into that because it's not my story to share. Okay. But yeah, it, it was not good. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show. And uh, I, as I told everybody, if you ever want to do part two, uh, just let me know and we can make that happen. Sometimes I just like to do part two just to check up on people in like a few months or whatnot. So yeah, I would love that. I would love that. It was so nice talking to you. Thank you for sharing so much of your story with me as well. And it truly was a pleasure. I really appreciate you and all the work that you're doing in this space. Appreciate you too. And don't forget to appreciate yourself on the 10 years. I think it's of sobriety, right? 10 years. Thank you. Yeah. I guess, Thank you. Uh, uh, that on the back. Um, and uh, with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching, especially if, for sure. If you've watched this far in the video, please like the video, share it, comment and all of that. And thank you so much for watching and wherever you are, have a good night, evening, day, whatever it is where you guys are. And with that, thank you for watching the show. Have a good night. <laughs>